Good morning to all of you. When I, when I started preparing the slides for the talk a couple of weeks ago, I wasn't quite sure how I was going to start. Uh, I knew I wanted to talk about vulnerabilities, the latest CVE being exploited. Uh, so I left this slide in here as a placeholder. And thankfully for me, just a few days ago, uh, what a pen tester wants, a security provider provides. And we had this awesome vulnerability in checkpoint firewalls. So I'm sure you've all been busy patching them. Um, it allows, it's a path traversal vulnerability which allows attackers to essentially read any file on the device remotely without authentication and so on. And in itself, it's a pretty serious vulnerability. It's, it should be shocking. Um, but I feel like we've just seen so many of them that we've become a little bit numb towards these issues, right? You see so many different vulnerabilities. They happen so frequently. There's really a month or a week that goes by without a new serious vulnerability affecting one of the products that pretty much everybody uses. Now, in the past, I've been responsible for some of these. Uh, I've done quite a bit of research. I always quite like targeting security products because I feel like if anybody should be more secure than others, it should be people selling security. Um, and I also happen to be one of the organizers at Insomniac, and I see I actually responsible for the CFP there, so I receive a lot of submissions for propo and proposals for talks. And a lot of them kind of revolve around the idea of researcher A finding vulnerability in product XYZ and illustrating why it was done, what, that, what was done there. So I thought, well, why don't I do the same thing? Which is why I'm here today, but it's really only a pretext to discuss something a little bit more serious, which is uh, why we have so many vulnerabilities and if there's anything we can actually do to try and reduce them at least a little bit. So the origin of the talk goes back a few years now uh, to the summer of 2021. Um, because it was a very slow uh, couple months for us. I think it was because COVID happened in 2020. Nobody could actually leave the country, so nobody went on holidays. So in 2021, pretty much all our customers were away, and we had nothing to do. So instead of just sitting and doing nothing, uh, I got around the table with a few of my colleagues and decided, well, we're, we'll work on some kind of research project, try and find vulnerabilities in a product. Um, we sat around the table, thought about which target we should look at, and came up with a list of the products that a lot of our customers use. And we ended up uh, on McAfee. So this was before they were bought by Trellix. Uh, McAfee for a couple reasons. One of them being that they, they don't necessarily have the best reputation in terms of antiviruses. We often joke about the fact that if McAfee actually blocks us during a pen test, we should probably retire and go flip some burgers at McDonald's instead. Um, but they also have a very large attack surface. They have lots of different products they sell that we could potentially potentially target. So we looked at McAfee. Uh, one of my colleagues is more into Windows exploitation, looked at the Windows agent that gets installed on, on your computers. Uh, one of my other colleagues looked at the mobile application uh, because it's more mobile related. And me having more of a background in web research, uh, I looked at the ePolicy Orchestrator, EPO for short, which happens to be the, the system, it's a web app, which kind of controls all the other uh, products within the McAfee ecosystem. So it's a... It's a Java-based web application that runs on Tomcat. Uh, so obviously, when, when I look at the vulnerabilities in this, I, I, I downloaded the latest version, installed it on my own system, looked at all the jars, the classes, and so on, decompiled them, and started using some super advanced hacking techniques to find vulnerabilities. So I usually kind of use two, two different approaches, one of them being try to identify the whole attack surface, what can be interacted with without authentication, typically and also lo looking for some specific vulnerabilities in the product. So I started with uh, searching for some very classic web uh, vulnerabilities, such as cross-site scripting. And again, this is super advanced techniques here. You can probably screenshot it if you want to, to find more vulnerabilities. Search for all the JSP files, uh, grep for anything that looked like variables being printed into the file, and just removed any reference to anything that was escaping or encoding. So very simple. This resulted in several thousands of essentially variable, variable names which are used as output in the JSP files. And then went through the Java source classes looking for any parameters which are used. Again, this resulted in a certain number, nearly a perfect number of parameter names there. And this does not in itself mean that anything is vulnerable, but we then matched the names of the ones which are used as an input with the ones that are actually output in the files. And very quickly, it resulted in finding many, many cross-site scripting issues. So we only reported about four, I think, to the, to the vendor in the end because uh, we got a bit bored. This was not the highest, the best use of our tools. Uh, I think if I'd known SEMgrep at the time, I would have definitely used SEMgrep. It would have been much more efficient and effective at finding more vulnerabilities. But we reported four of them. 
one of them just as a, an example here. Um, so cross-scripting is probably not the most interesting vulnerability. I don't think any company has been compromised due to cross-site scripting vulnerability. So I went a little bit further, decided to look at SQL injections. It's already a bit, bit more interesting. Again, super elite hacking techniques here, gripping for the term select with a space after it within the Java source code, and then looking for any places where uh, they're concatenating strings, essentially. So having a string ending with a quote plus something else in Java. And usually, like this is 2020, it was 21, 2021 or 2022, uh, SQL injection should be a thing of the past, right? Nobody should be concatenating user input to SQL parameters. But this, again, resulted in hundreds, if not thousands, of different occurrences of this really poor coding pattern, right? This should not happen in any in any product. And of course, when you see this, you're like, okay, we're going to find vulnerabilities. A little bit of research. We ended up finding uh, three, uh, four, four different ones. Again, I'm pretty sure it's not the whole extent of vulnerabilities in the product. Um, one of them is taken here. Uh, it, this one is specifically interesting compared to the other ones because it can be exploited uh, through a cross-site request, request forgery attack. So you get anyone to click on this link and it will trigger the SQL injection. And of course, by default, uh, ePolicy Orchestrator connects to a Microsoft SQL server database with DBO privileges. So anybody who's been doing pen testing will know that that pretty much guarantees that you'll be, you'll be able to fully compromise that backend server. So essentially, through a single click, you can theoretically at least uh, access a uh, fully compromised backend server. So I hope you rarely have uh, EPO administrators doing other work while they're administering their EPO. The likelihood of someone actually clicking on a link is relatively low, but I've seen stranger things during our assessments. Um, but these, all these issues are actually all required authentication, which was not really super interesting to me because I'm never going to exploit any of these in real case scenarios. So we continued looking for anything that might be exploitable without requiring credentials. And we ended up looking at uh, one specific function within EPO, which allows an administrator to restore the admin account if he's lost it. So it looks uh, like what I've got up here on screen. So you have to target a specific endpoint. And the way they allow for password reset is that you have to know the credentials of the backend database. So if you give the super admin account for the backend database, the password for the database, it will actually allow you to reset the application admin account within EPO. So you think, well, why not? Um, that could, could work, right? Uh, digging into the code, I found that there are a couple other parameters you can actually add to this, namely the database itself, which the database you want to use, and the database name. So there's actually a very trivial technique that you can use to essentially reset the password by specifying your own database, right? So you send a URL like the one we've got here, restore the admin, use this specific database, so the EPO server will, will connect to your hacker database, asking, well, can I connect with the credentials you just provided? Of course, you can. Why wouldn't you? And the magic here is that instead of actually changing any credentials in here, EPO will actually go and change the credentials in the actual EPO database, which was <laughs> pretty cool to say the least. Um, so this is already a pretty interesting finding. There is a couple of caveats, though, one of them being that you need, obviously, network connectivity here between the EPO server and your own SQL server, which may or may not happen that frequently. And the other one, which I haven't mentioned yet, is that this can actually only be triggered from the EPO server itself. You can only do it from localhost. So it's like, okay, it's interesting, but it's not what's going to allow me to fully compromise the server yet. So we continued searching, and uh, a little bit later, we found another unauthenticated endpoint, which actually happens to have what we call an XML external entity attack, or XXE. Again, these should be should no longer exist anywhere. Um, but we found one specific endpoint which can be reached without authentication. I believe it's probably used by agents to communicate with EPO. Can't remember exactly. And if you use the correct, correct formatting and encoding, you actually have uh, a perfect XXE vulnerability in here, which allows you, as any XXE vulnerability, to read files on the server, or more interestingly in our case, to perform what we call server-side request forgery attacks, so SSRF. Now, why is this interesting? Uh, because you can force the server essentially to connect back to itself. So kind of bypassing uh, the issue I had with the previous vulnerability to be able to actually reset the admin password. So in theory, by combining the two vulnerabilities, you can use the XXE 
unauthenticated, force the server to reset the admin password and compromise the server in that way. Now, unfortunately for me, it wasn't actually that trivial. Uh, the reason behind this is actually slightly kind of interesting, is that the XML attack would go through the Java JVM, so the XML parser in Java would try, try, try to do the server-side request forgery attack, and EPO only listens on a SSL-enabled port, and the certificate used by EPO is not actually recognized by the JVM, unfortunately. Despite the JVM actually generating it, it will then save it in the Windows certificate store, but not in the Java one. So I never actually got to fully compromise or get the full execution chain to, to work. I did think about it and tried to figure out whether there were any edge cases where this might still be possible. I came up with two potential solutions. Um, if EPO actually happens to use some kind of what I call publicly signed uh, SSL certificates or something which is recognized by the JVM, that the attack might still be possible. Or if uh, we're able to trigger a server-side request forgery from something else than the JVM on the machine, then you'd potentially also be able to exploit the vulnerability. So for the first case, I think if, if, the, um, if the EPO server happens to use like a wildcard SSL certificate, which in practice probably will never happen, but you never know, and that the target com company has a subdomain which resolves to localhost, then you could potentially still exploit the vulnerability. Probably not going to happen in practice, but you never know. Again, I've seen some pretty weird things during our assessments. Uh, and for the server-side request forgery, you might be tempted into thinking that you could use uh, vulnerabilities such as the printer bug, but you put them or others to try and force Windows to connect back to itself. Uh, the problem here is that by default, these will use the SMB protocol, and you need the web client service to be running on the server to essentially force it to use HTTP instead. Um, and this is very unlikely on a server. Like Usually, the web client service will not be uh, even present on a server, unless maybe you have EPO on the same service, server as a SharePoint, something like that. Or if somebody's running EPO on a, on a workstation, that uh, might still be possible to exploit. So there are some very, very rare edge cases where it might be possible to exploit the vulnerability, but overall, probably looking quite uh, unlikely, right? Um, so you might be getting to why the talk is titled the way it is. Uh, but while I was doing all of this, uh, my colleagues were also working on their own uh, assignments, and in the, in the Windows agent, we found a privilege escalation vulnerability, so using McAfee agent on, a, on an endpoint, you could become local administrator on there. I'm not going to talk about the details because we reported the issue, this was already several years ago, uh, but instead of fixing it, they asked us if it was still, uh, if it still worked on the latest, latest version of the software to which we never responded. I figured they can probably try and figure that out on, the, on, their, on their selves. So it might still be there. And for the mobile application, we also found, here my colleague wrote a full blog post on what he found exactly, but essentially uh, some poorly configured stuff in the, in the mobile application allows you to have a malicious application which will use the McAfee app to do other things on the, on the, on the phone, essentially. So these were all discovered within a relatively short amount of time. Uh, I put 10 days in there, but that's probably an, exagger an exaggeration, actually, um, which should really be a bit shocking. I mean, we shouldn't be able to find such trivial vulnerabilities, and I'm not here trying to display my hacking skills because obviously this was not super difficult to find, but we should be shocked by this. It's not normal that we hire so, such trivial vulnerabilities in software which is sold and used by everybody, essentially. And as much as I like making fun of uh, McAfee, they're by far not the only ones uh, who have these kind of problems. Uh, if we look at the number of vulnerabilities, the CVEs that are published on a daily basis, we can see that there's a pretty obvious trend, which is, I don't think, going in the right direction, right? Uh, now, I've been doing pen testing for like 15 or 16 years now, finding vulnerabilities, reporting them, disclosing them uh, responsibly, getting them patched, finding the next vulnerability, getting a patch, hoping to do a difference, essentially, hoping to make the world a safer place. Uh, but I don't think that's what's happening. Now, this is probably skewed by the fact that more people report vulnerabilities, more people actually generate CVs and so on. But even so, I don't think it paints a pretty picture. And if we continue in the way we're, conti we're doing now, this will never get solved. I mean, we just continue seeing more and more vulnerabilities out there. And I think one of the main reasons behind this 
is probably this notion that it is impossible to write secure software. This is something that I've, you've probably have heard somebody or someone or another say this. I can't write secure software. It's just impossible to write something which does not have any bugs. Unfortunately, the problem when you say that something is impossible is that it kind of discourages people from even trying to do that. And it also gives a very easy way out to people who sell you insecure software. Like, yeah, well, it's impossible to write secure software. Why, why are you worried about the fact there's a bug in here? It's, it's just normal. And this has really been drilled into everybody around it. Is you're like, well, there are going to be vulnerabilities. There's pretty much nothing we can do about it, which I don't think is actually true. Uh, I recognize that it is very difficult to write in secure software, not insecure software. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's completely impossible or that you shouldn't actually try to do it, right? But the problem is that there are very few incentives nowadays that will kind of push companies to actually write secure software. And that's kind of the main idea behind, behind this talk. Now, there are a few consequences that I've noticed uh, due to this thought process, I think, uh, which is that very often customers who buy a product actually happen to be the ones that have to pay for the poor security. Like, we have a lot of customers that will contract us to test a solution they bought. So we do the, the customer pays us to do the testing for a security or for a solution that they bought from somewhere else. And in certain cases, when we, when we file the report, we give them, we found all these vulnerabilities in this product. Well, the, the end, the vendor will actually charge them more money to, to correct the vulnerabilities. Like, well, this is going to take us a week or two to actually fix. It's going to cost you an extra 10,000 francs, right? And this is surprisingly not that uncommon. It happens quite a lot. So in the end, the customer has to pay the price for, uh, the poorly secured product that they bought, right? Which is a bit of a shame. And this also kind of transpires in the whole licensing models that pretty much every software or hardware that you buy has. So you buy the, you buy the, the solution and then you're going to have to pay for a renewable, renewable license, which will allow, allow you to get the updates, the security fixes and so on. So you're paying through the license, uh, the vendor to actually fix the solution that they, where they had the vulnerabilities in the first place, right? Which is a bit strange because it really, I'd be a little, a little bit sarcastic and say that it actually pushes companies to introduce vulnerabilities in the first place so that they can then charge you to correct them, which is a bit strange, and I don't like that too much. And then you have the, la the last model, which is probably the, the Microsoft model, where security is uh, an option within their system, and you have to pay extra to get it. This is becoming more and more common as well. So you have the base thing, which is insecure, and you can have the secure version of whatever you're buying if you pay a little bit more. I kind of like comparing that to like the food industry where you might have your organic apple somewhere, uh, which costs you a certain price. And then you have the, the, the non-organic, poorly, poorly produced apple right next, next to it, which has lots of pesticides in it, which is probably half rotten. Um, but it's cheaper. And as a customer, in certain cases, well, you don't have the, you don't have the chance, you don't have enough money to buy the, the good product and you end up buying the poor one and you're going to be paying the consequences of that. I don't think the customers should have to choose between having a secure or an insecure product. It should be secure by default, right? So I realize this is not necessarily obvious. And another consequence of this mantra, I guess, or this way of thinking is that we have been racing to patch vulnerabilities on a constant basis. Like you have one more vulnerability here, we have to patch it quickly and so on. And this kind of ties into what our keynote speaker in Insomniac was saying, is that we're not really focusing on the right thing here. We're fo focusing on patching vulnerabilities and I've noticed that we also have a tendency to even like, make fun or shame or even get people fired for using vulnerable software because they didn't patch it fast enough, like they didn't put, apply the update under product within the last week, so they are, they are the devil, and it's their fault they get compromised. Uh, but by always racing to, the pa racing to patch everything, we're not actually fixing the systemic, systemic problem of there being vulnerabilities in the first place, right? Um, and you're really discharging the people who write insecure software from the consequences. Like, the consequences are completely decorrelated from the cause. Um, Again, when you take the, the pen testing example I had earlier, when you're paying for a pen test for a product that you bought, the person who sold you the product doesn't have to pay the price. Um, and if you happen to get compromised, if you're within a company, you, you have a super secure VPN in front, which protects you from the outside world, and you happen to get compromised, you get fully pillaged by a ransomware attack that came in through 
a one day attack in your VPN that you didn't have time to patch within the first couple of days, well, it's going to be your fault. You're going to be losing a lot of money. You're going to have to pay to get everything set up again. You have to restore your systems. You're going to lose a lot of uh, money because, because of all of this. But the person who actually sold you the vulnerable software in the first place couldn't care less. And to be perfectly fair, uh, since there's absolutely no impact on them, why should they do better, right? Um, and I'm stealing again a, a quote from, from, our, from Charles a month ago. Uh, I think pretty much everybody here in the room probably profits from, me included, profits from the fact that vulnerabilities exist. Whether you're a pen tester, whether you're a CISO, you have a job probably because there are vulnerabilities, because either you exploit them or you patch them or you try to patch them and correct them and so on. So we're probably not the best place uh, to actually get to a solution. But I think we can at least think of some of them. It will probably require other actions outside of us as well. But I think there are things that are possible. Um, and just coming back on the consequences, I thought it would be funny to just kind of look at whether any of the critical vulnerabilities discovered in products have any kind of impact on the share price of a company. Uh, just happened to have two examples here of um, some of the vendors that are actually here. Uh, Taking an, an example here with Palo Alto, I just took probably not all the vulnerabilities, just the most critical ones that I could t come up with in 2021 here, a nice CVS, CVS S10, so without authentication, full compromise of the device from the internet. Not quite sure there's any kind of correlation with them losing any money here anywhere. The same with the last one here, took Fortinet as well because they do have a track record of having quite a few vulnerabilities. And again, uh, it's difficult to kind of have any conclusions on it take any conclusions out of this. It doesn't seem like them having vulnerabilities in their software impacts their bottom line in any kind of way. And I'm not trying to single out anyone here, not, neither McAfee nor Palo or Fortinet. Uh, and probably nobody in this room is particularly surprised by this. Um, but I think you should be. I mean, it's not normal that these, these products that we buy, which are vulnerable, don't actually pay any consequences for them be, being vulnerable. So. Can we do better? Uh, and this is something which I've been thinking about for, for a while now, is how can we try and get out of this constant patching rhythm, essentially? And I certainly hope so, uh, because again, as I was mentioning, if we don't, I think it's just going to continue having all these problems, and the customers are always going to be paying the price for the, the poor security. And one way I think we can do better is trying to align the incentives um, that companies have when selling software. So right now, if you had to buy a product somewhere, probably the things you're going to be looking at are going to be the price of the product. I think this is the case for pretty much anything you're going to be buying. You're probably going to look at the features. You want to make sure that product does what you need it to do, which makes sense. And if it has more features, well, great. You're probably never going to use them, but they're there. And you're probably going to be looking at performance. You want the, the product to do what you want in a relatively fast kind of way. So obviously, as a vendor, so there might be some other things that come into con consideration. Um, most notably, uh, especially since like the, the war in Ukraine and other places, you might look into the um, where, where a company comes from. So you might blacklist certain certain countries from that. But for the most part, I think these are probably the three main factors which come into consideration when you're buying a product. And of course, as a vendor, this is going to push you to uh, lower the prices, try to sell your software at the most cheapest cheapest price. Increase the features, you want as many features as possible, and uh, have increased performance as well. Now, unfortunately, when you look at that from a security perspective, lowering the price is probably going to get you to hire less qualified engineers, less qualified developers. You're going to write poorer or less secure code. More features obviously increases the attack surface. You're going to have a lot more potential vulnerabilities in what you're selling. And the performance also is going to probably push you to disable security features because in a lot of cases, they actually slow things down. Well, not in a lot of cases. In some cases, they do slow things down. So obviously, these three main incentives that we see when you're buying something push vendors to essentially do a really poor job on security. So how can we do a little bit better? How can we actually incentivize uh, vendors to to write better software, better hardware. And I think there are generally two ways they can go around um, doing this pretty much for anything. Is either you have like positive incentives where you reward someone for doing something well, or negative incentives where you punish uh, someone for doing something poorly. So 
in our case, I think something that has already been going around right now uh, in the penalties category would be just shaming uh, vendors for their poorly written software. I mean, one of one of the reasons I'm up here. Um, and if you've never read the Watchtower blog, I think it's always worth worthwhile. They, they do a lot of analysis on one-day vulnerabilities, so they look at the latest vulnerability in whatever product and try and figure out where it comes from. And there's always some somewhat humorous uh, quotes in there explaining how trivial the vulnerabilities are and how shameful it is. Uh, but overall, unfortunately, I don't think this has much impact. I mean, this has been happening for a long time. Uh, we know that there are vulnerabilities in products, and as I was saying, we've become numb to this. It's just such a regular occurrence that we're like, yeah, okay, one more vulnerability. I'm pretty sure the other vendors we have uh, are not much better than us. Um, other possibilities here when it comes to penalties, and this is probably where I get into some more controversial topics, is um, the one that I would quite like to see happen is just essentially fining vendors for their poor, poor security. And I can see that in two, two different ways. Obviously, I'm not a lawyer, and it will require a lot of other things to, to get this into place. But either just find them whenever there's a vulnerability. Like, you can kind of nearly see that as sort of a uh, forced bug bounty. So whenever there is a vulnerability discovered, they have to pay a certain price. That would obviously give you some incentive to write better code. Or uh, when your software is responsible for a breach within a company, you're going to be liable for a part of the losses within that company, which is probably a lot harder to, to do. But there are things that you can potentially imagine which would push companies to write more secure software. If, you actually, if your bottom line is hit by the vulnerabilities you introduce, it might push you to do a little bit better, right? Uh, other things which are probably more um, in the realm of possibilities uh, would be just requiring uh, certain security assessments or certain security aspects in the contracts you have when you buy a, a product. Make sure that you can have security updates free of charge. Make sure there's a, some kind of pen test or security assessment, assessment which was done that you don't have to pay for, and so on. So I think there are th a number of things that can be done on the contractual side uh, to try and incentivize companies to do a little bit better. And if one day we have some kind of fines that are introduced, I think that will probably have the biggest impact. But obviously, I don't think we're near that yet. But I do think it could be a way forward. Um, but penalties only go so far. And I think it's probably more interesting if we can actually give some positive in incentives or so reward companies for uh, the better software, the better code they're writing. And to be able to do this, you essentially uh, have to be able to compare different uh, different products, right? yeah, to be able to determine how one uh, product is better than another, which is not as easy as it may seem. Uh, I mean, I know that during our pen test engagements, very often our customers will ask us how they fare compared to other customers in the same industry, which in practice is really difficult to do. Uh, but there are some ways of doing this. and. I really like the, um, I don't know if you're aware of the cyber ITL. I didn't actually know, that, know about them until quite recently. Unfortunately, there's not been much uh, activity on their website for a few years now. But their whole idea was to kind of rate, uh, in this case, browsers and a couple other things based on a number of security metrics that they had defined. Uh, those metrics being the, the code hygiene, how, can, how many dangerous functions were being used within their software, what, what safety features were enabled within the software and so on, and give them a metric that could be easily compared between different products of the same category. And I think this is actually a, a great idea, which hopefully we can actually kind of expand to a lot more things than just browsers. Because I do think that if, when you buy a software, you can actually have some kind of metric which tells you, well, this one is, okay, it's more expensive, there might be less features than the other one, but it's a lot more secure, I do think some people will go for the more secure product. But right now, there's no real way of, of knowing this. So I really like this idea. Under a number of metrics that can be used, uh, the ones they had typically for safety features, this way, like all the binary protection things like ASLR, DEP, PIE, and so on, you can very easily determine whether uh, a product actually uses these. So it's very easily re reproducible. Uh, when it comes to web applications, it might be a little bit more tricky, but you have a lot of configuration things that can that can be looked into, whether they're default error pages or HTTP headers, cookie configuration, and so on. Uh, the more interesting part is probably looking at the code hygiene, looking at how frequently an application or product uses dangerous functions. Like nowadays, you would think nobody would be using string copy anymore, right? 
Nobody uses that. Uh, but actually, if you look at any VPN vendor, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of occurrences of these within their products. Uh, so it's quite interesting to just to look at how frequently these dangerous functions are used. Um, when it comes to web applications, the, the SQL injection example I was talking about earlier, looking at how frequently uh, user input is concatenated to SQL queries and so on can also be looked at and so on. So there's, there are a number of metrics that should or can be defined to be able to compare different products within a certain category. Um, one thing that I was discussing with a colleague recently was also just looking at CVE scoring, uh, like looking at the CVSS and CVE scores of a certain product or even just a vendor. I think it would be interesting to have some, some kind of notion of like the mean time to the next critical vulnerability, for example. If you know that when you're buying this specific product, you're probably going to have to have some kind of emergency patching session every month because that's how frequently vulnerabilities come out. It might discourage you from buying that specific product compared to another one, which only happens every two years or so. And this is actually a very easy metric to put up and to actually compare. So obviously at the beginning, it might not be that great because you'll have like new companies that happen or new products, which nobody will have researched yet. So they won't have any kind of vulnerabilities discovered yet. But over time, it should balance out to give some kind of accurate metric. Um, you could also have a number of other non-technical metrics that come into play, uh, such as the presence of bug bounty platforms for the specific products, um, how, yes, okay. how, how, they de how quickly they patch a vulnerability if you're able to actually get that information. Those are probably a little bit, little bit harder to actually measure, but they could also kind of come into how you calculate a security score for uh, a company or a product. And I think, again, this is not something that I expect any customer uh, to do when you're buying a product. You're not going to go out and search for this, search for all these scores. So I think there could be two ways of approaching this. Um, I do kind of kind of like the idea of like a nutri sort system where essentially vendors have to grade themselves. It's not always a great solution, but it, it ha forces them to give themselves a grade between well, in, the, in the food family between A and E or so on, on how healthy the food is. And you could have something similar where vendors would have to provide information on how secure their own devices are. Um, obviously, this would require quite a lot of regulation to come into play, something that we're not going to see immediately, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting idea. Uh, the other one, which is probably more attainable, is to have some kind of community-driven score where security researchers, when they do a research product on a specific product, could actually kind of contribute to a, an open source database of sorts where you say what kind of features, what kind of security features are used by this or that product. And this over time, again, could be maintained by as many researchers as they are. And this would mostly go out to any of the security researchers who spend their time selling vulnerabilities on the darknet and so on, or try to have a, a positive outcome of these, those research as well by informing the public on how secure a product actually is. I mean, very often when you embark on a research project, within a matter of minutes, you're looking at the code, you're like, this stinks. And you know you're going to find a lot of vulnerabilities. And it's, it is an interesting information to have for the greater public, I think. So just to kind of wrap up what I've been saying, I think that unfortunately, because of the frequency and the occurrences of vulnerabilities that we're seeing nowadays, we have become really numb to them, kind of accepted the fact that there are vulnerabilities as something that cannot be changed. Uh, which is really sad in my eyes. And unfortunately, it is the customers paying the price for this. Uh, the, the people who actually sell the, the, the products, the insecure products, don't actually have many consequences to them. But I do think that we can actually change this by kind of aligning incentives and giving reasons for vendors to do, to do better, essentially, be it by penalizing them for poorly written software, uh, poorly written code, or rewarding them for better software by being able to compare different things and giving them a reason to care about this. Now, what can we actually do? Um, as customers, when you're buying a product, I think one of the important things is to actually look through the contract and make sure that you're not going to be the one paying for the vulnerabilities if there are some. So again, make sure that in the contract you have some kind of uh, notion that they have to have had some kind of security assessment on the product. Have a look at what kind of scope duration was actually used on there. Uh, ask for security code, code 
uh, secure coding certificates by the developers or something like that. There are a number of things that can actually be asked here. And if you can actually introduce clauses in the contract which will fine the vendor for vulnerabilities, great. I don't expect that to happen in the short term, but maybe if enough people start requiring it, it might happen one day. And for the more broader security communi community out there, I think really kind of giving some transparency on the, on the, on the security level of products that you're researching will help others in, in selecting the more secure ones. I mean, right now there is no real way to determine whether one product is better than another in most cases. But if we actually work on this, build some kind of global database where we uh, have this information in there, I do think it would be able to, pos to push people to buy more secure software and thus incentivize the vendors to have more secure uh, products. Um, and that is something I'm actually currently working on, is trying to establish this for VPN devices. You mean, I mentioned quite a few of them today. So hopefully within the next few months, we'll have some kind of initial rating that we can publish out there for uh, a number of VPN products. So obviously, I don't think what I'm discussing here is necessarily easy, uh, but I don't think it's impossible either. And even if it were impossible or really difficult, I don't think it would discourage us from at least trying to do it. So that is pretty much it from me. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any questions, I reckon we still have a few minutes before lunch. Thanks for listening. All right. Thank you very much for the interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions? We still have some time left. I, I see you had one question. I'll give you that. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for the talk. Um, there's actually one thing uh, I noticed recently, a couple of years, which is interesting regarding the penalty versus incentive approach. Uh, that, that is due to ransomware, insurers started to provide cybersecurity insurances. And looks like they learned that it can get quite expensive if people are not prepared, companies. So they are requiring more and more um, base levels to even provide insurance. Um, do you think this is also a way which could lead to to a better outcome? And maybe uh, we as the security, security community should approach or work closer with those insurers to leverage their reach? Um, good, good question. I'm, I'm still a bit on the fence with uh, regards to insurance. Uh, typically, it, We've had some cases where like ransomware groups will actually target companies because they have insurance and they know, they know they'll get paid because of that. So there are some drawbacks to, to that as well. And the insurance itself will usually just cover like the company that's getting hacked and it doesn't really cover the people that sold them the vulnerable software. So I'd, if there is a way to kind of measure that in there somewhere, why not? Uh, but I'm not sure I see an obvious way of doing it right now, but it could be, yeah. Any other question or feedback? Don't be shy. Or if you are, you are still around. I'm still uh, around. So of course, like feel hungry. free to approach Anna as well. Uh, then, yeah, thank you very much uh, again. A uh, big round of applause, and we're done. <laughs> <laughs>